McCarthy reunited on Saturday night with Miriam at 25 to 11. But now on RTE1, O'Shea, a legacy. Listen a store, when Kerry take the field. Tell me when they attack and when they yield. Say if they fail, a store, I'm blind and old. Tell me they'll not dishonor the green and gold. This is the story of a Gaelic football hero. He was at the heart of a small rural community in West Kerry, a businessman who courted politicians and celebrities, a player who created a footballing legacy that still reverberates. It was a career, however, shrouded in controversy. I would have said the party had many demons. It was complicated. You never knew really what to expect. He was a devil like. He was a tough guy, but he was a great athlete, a skillful footballer. It would have been difficult if I hadn't been interested in football myself. Poddy's success had a huge impact on his nephews. They were like granite. When you hit them, you knew it. Pre-match, if there was a parade, he had that Saturday night fever strut. You know, he did take the rituals seriously. Being a footballer in Kerry defines you as a man. The more successful you are, the more people respect you. Very friendly with Charlie Hawley. The two of them inextricably linked. They came in their thousands. They came to meet him. They came to shake his hands. He said, am I being replaced? And I said, you are. And that conversation ended fairly abruptly. You knew he had a puss in him. That's how I describe it. There was a deeper side to him. I think he was essentially a very, very shy man. It's two and a half years since Paddy O'Shea's shock death at the age of 57. But like his father, only son Padraig O'Shea carries on a footballing tradition playing for his club on Gaeltacht. Winning is very important. People around here, they want Kerry winning all Ireland's every year, so they, they'd be kind of under pressure to deliver that. did a lot of training around here. He used the, the mountains and the roads and he used this route coming over the edge of the mountain and down the other side and back to Ventry, which was, which was nearly 13 miles. And he used to do that before going into Kerry training at night. He knew it would take him one step closer to winning all Ireland's each year for his county. This is actually Paddy's mother's handwriting. This, these were, this was the bag she kept them in. They're still there. They're the All-Ireland ones. Uh, there's a nice uh, West Kerry one. Actually, not, that's it. Uh, but anything uh, with Gaeltacht or even West, West Kerry, he was extremely proud of. And then when the lads came along and when they started playing, it was the same thing, you know, they each needed to be better than the one before. But, um, yeah, they're very special. Yeah, you're sort of um, known in Kerry if you have at least one of these. Paddy O'Shea was born in 1955 in Ceantra, County Kerry. His parents, Beatrice and Tommy, returned to Ireland in the 1950s, reversing a tradition of economic migration. There was no work in lots of parts of Ireland. As it happened, Tommy O'Shea decided that he would go and join a lot of people from West Kerry in, in London. And it was there that he met Beatrice, who was actually from Sligo. They struck up a friendship, it became a romance, and uh, they married. But they both always hankered to return to Ireland. And then Tommy had an accident at work in England, received some compensation, heard from the family back home that there was a shop uh, available. They came back to Ireland with two sons, Michal and Tom, and Paddy was born here. As the youngest of the family, Paddy was certainly was, was Beatrice's pet. And Beatrice, you know, had ambitions for Paddy. When Paddy trained, she'd have a glass of sherry, she'd have the vat running. When Paddy would have bathed then, she'd have the steak sizzling on the table. He'd call in her and she'd give him 20 euro, and we used to get a fiver. 
and sometimes it'd go up, we'd get a tenner and sometimes he'd get 50, but he used to always get more than us. He was, always, he was really minded as a, as a child, I'd say. He could do no wrong. To get on the Kerry team, that was his ambition, instilled into him by his mother, you know, but nothing was going to get in the way of that. We were married maybe a few weeks and he said, Mom always washed my boots. I said, she can keep doing it. Beatrice's encouragement of Paddy's prowess was first played out at St. Brendan's School. Paddy was a student with an eye more on football than books. He wasn't stupid, but everything revolved around football. There's a story about when the Gweltacht were playing a very important match and they wanted Paddy 16 at that time. They said they needed Paddy, so they sent me Hollow Shea to request Paddy's presence on the team. Michal said to the headmaster, listen, I promise you, as soon as the final whistle blows, I'll have him back here. And the headmaster looked at him, the priest, and he said, my dear man, you'd be doing myself and everybody here at St. Brendan's a favour if you didn't bring him back at all. And eventually, Paddy left St. Brendan's. Um, some illicit material purchased in a bookshop in London possibly was the reason. As a young player, he was exceptional, would have won the Sullivan Cup with Listowel, which was the first time they ever won it. It would have been a big signpost on the way that here was a player coming who was going to make a, you know, a lot of noise when he got to senior level. In the 1970s, Pawdy was in his late teens. Kerry football was in a building phase, reconstructing a team with a tradition dating back to the Civil War. 1923. Civil War was over. It was very, very bitter in Kerry. And great players were on opposite sides. And somebody got the idea, it's over, we should come together for the sake of Kerry. And out of that then grew a Kerry team of footballers, regardless of what the backgrounds were, politically or anything. It engendered a great spirit. Bitter enemies during the Civil War, the best of friends putting on that Kerry jersey, which was dear to them. From this tradition came a fledgling warrior primed for battle. He was only 19 when he was brought in for the National League final in 74. And the following winter, the Munster final, um, you know, where Cork were favourites to win the match. They had some great, great players on that team, including Dilly Allen, with whom Paddy would have that, that famous incident. And there's Donald Hunt, number 17 on his back. Dennis Allen, and Dennis throws a punch there and then gets a belt back in the face. My recollection of, of the incident was a, a low ball was cleared out of, of the cock defence and I caught it in my chest and Paddy was, was behind me. The referee, just as he blew for the free, I brought my elbow back at the same time. I know I caught Paddy in the, in the chin or the lip or something like that and Paddy decided at that stage to give me a wallop straight in front of the referee. I say he was going to get me back somewhere or it actually wasn't as bad as what it, it looked because he caught me high up in the head. But I threw myself down in the hope that he mightn't take my name, but he took my name as well and told us, right, Les, that's the end of his shake hands. And there's the shake hands. It's scandalous to see it now. The two of them would be suspended probably for 12 months, would probably be had up in court. Unfairness to party, I think it's a bit unfair just to kind of concentrate everything into one YouTube clip of 10 seconds of him, you know, giving some for a box. And in fairness to Dinny, he, you know, he did start it, I suppose, in fairness. The new look Kerry team took to the field in the 1975 senior football final against Dublin. No one saw the result coming. A uh, young team came out, a uh, team of bachelors at the time, and uh, it was uh, it created a great buzz around Kerry. David Hickey now. When Cork were out of the picture, we felt, you know, we were, we were onto a good thing here, really. And uh, we kind of walked into a bit of a sucker punch uh, that September day. I mean, they tore, tore us apart. Out towards Ogie Moran. Ogie cutting through the centre. And a lock in his after him. John Egan with the ball now. In front of the corner. And it's a goal. Yes, it's a goal. It's a goal. Kerry are the champions. They're worthy champions. And the Dublin followers knocked into silence. And out the field, the Kerry supporters into mob and cheer their heroes. It was a bit of a surprise. It was a phenomenal win for Kerry. Paul uh, The rivalry with Dublin is always something special. Look, it's Colchis versus the, um, the City boys, and that's it. 
you know, so it created a great atmosphere. At the helm of the successful Kerry team was one Mick O'Dwyer, a man who would help define the career of Paddy O'Shea. He dropped a lot of players. He brought in this bunch of youngsters. He trained them savagely hard. He'd literally bring you over the edge. He'd just mentally grind you into the ground. You could describe it as kind of boot camp stuff. We'd do these hard runs to wit of the pitch and back. And straight away when they came back, I can still see them up jogging. I'd be bent over wondering was I going to puke. And party at that time like was bursting, ready to go for the second one. They exceeded Mikko's expectations. And at one stage it came out and God I knew they were good, but I didn't know they were that good. Jack O'Shea! Paddy and the team had kicked off a winning streak. Kerry went on to take seven more All Irelands during Paddy's playing career. They were unstoppable. Paddy O'Shea, he shakes off a tackle, takes They changed the game forever. The, the simplest way of putting it, they were the greatest team in the history of the GA. They had too many good guys on the pitch. Like if one fella had an off day, there's another three fellas pop up. We tried everything to beat them. Kind of iconic status. They were like pop stars, and their their names were synonymous with success. And uh, they just carried them to themselves a particular way as well. They knew it. They knew they were good. You know. But playing county football doesn't pay a wage. Poddy needed a job and took on two. He became a Garda, and not long after, opened a pub. The fact that he wasn't the greatest guard in Ireland's history is well attested. Uh, nowhere more so than the famous you know, story of him pulling into a field in the squad car for a sleep, waking up to find either a sergeant, an inspector, a superintendent, depending on who's telling the story, peering in at him. And I think probably from that moment on, his days as a boy in blue were probably numbered. His brother Tom encouraged him to, to come back and to take the lease of cruisers. And I think it was when he went to cruisers in Dunqueen and got to know the islanders there and listened to their stories and how they told the stories, which was very important, because he suddenly realised the story didn't have to be true. You could put legs in it. So I think that was part of the development of Paddy's character. It was there in Cruisers, his friendship with Charlie Hahi. It began in 1980. Um, you know, two guys who came together and found they had so much in common. They, they were both very ambitious people, um, but they both loved a laugh and they both loved Irish culture. And of course, they shared the, the, the traditional Fianna Fáil Republican views. We were in Dublin Airport one morning. We had a couple of hours to spend, and Paddy rang me the night before, and he said, Mr. Chairman, he says, uh, we're going to Kinsale in the morning for breakfast. So I was, of course, obviously delighted. I wanted to see Kinsale, and I suppose maybe I wanted to see CJ as well. There was a taxi strike out of the time, and that didn't stop Paddy, because he got a Gala car who collected us, dropped us in Kinsale, waited for us. Uh, we were walking down the corridor to have breakfast with Mr. Hawhey, and he was in crutches at the time. He had broken his ankle and he said to Paddy, he said, Paddy, did, did you break any bones in your playing career? Oh, no, Taoiseach, he says, none of my own. So, you know, he felt comfortable enough to have that conversation with the Taoiseach. And it's Kerry in possession again, Paul O'Shea. By 1980, Paddy O'Shea was firmly established as a key defensive player on Mick O'Dwyer's Kerry team. 1980 All-Ireland, Jigger Connor drew on a ball and Paddy dived to block it with his head just there at the left corner of the square. And, um, you know, it was just total disregard for his own safety. And um, that's, you know, the, that's the courage he had, you know. I kind of, in a perverse way, kind of looked forward to meeting him on the football pitch. And I was a bit, a bit quicker than him, so I, I at least get out to the ball ahead of him. But getting past him on the way back in was always a bit of a problem. Paddy's success on the pitch began to influence a new generation of Kerry footballers. There's two windows in a church. They'd be like two goalposts. They're big windows. But they have very, very small panes of glass on them. So if the ball lamped into them, there'd be two or three panes gone in one goal. Like. It actually came to the point where the priest set it from the altar and actually blamed, I think, Mark, my brother, which was fairly embarrassing, but 
I mean, Paul used to come out and just lamp the ball up and maybe smash three or four and start laughing. This guy wouldn't even darken the door of the church anyway, so the priest wouldn't actually give out to him anyway. It was us that he'd get the blame. Around here, Paddy walked the street, drove the streets. He was one of our own, so we could actually reach out and touch this because you must remember too in those days, they didn't do you know, a lot of stuff on TV for, for these players, but they were there, and these were the guys that were bringing the Sam McGuire to your school. The 1980s was also a travel decade for Kerry. Tours were an end-of-season reward. Trips to the US and Australia created a strong bond between players. We must have been in America 40 times and he was like the entertainment manager. He'd always have the bath in the rooms full of ice and water and the beers inside in case we didn't get uh, a late bar. My 22nd birthday, I think it was, he had a party arranged above in the room for me, got all the lads back and I was presented with just a small television and sure all the lads had done was taken it from the reception down below, brought it up, presented speeches and everything. Once the match was over, like we'd have our few pints in Dublin, say if we played Dublin, we'd have a few drinks coming down the train and then we'd finish in Cork and finish the pints. But it's hard to imagine, but that's the way that's the way it was, you know. And Kerry have won the All Ireland final. If a team won the championship match, the manager might say to them on Sunday evening, I won't see you until Wednesday or Thursday. Code for going and drink it out for the next two or three days. That wouldn't happen, no, because the sports science has evolved to a point where physical trainer would say, look, we need to get these guys back in, get them into the pool, a bit of recovery, etc." In 1984, Paddy O'Shea married local girl Moira Fahey at a quiet ceremony in Orda Woher. This was a busy period on the pitch. Paddy also set sights on establishing a business. He wanted a pub across the road from where he grew up. That had planning difficulties and objections. And it was there that Paddy's connections first began to show um, what they could achieve for him. It was Charlie Hahi who advised him on his planning application. And eventually, he got planning permission for the pub in Ardham Bower. He was captain in 85 as well. There was a rush to, to open the pub and the monster final. And... It was so exciting and they got so much support. Paddy attracted a very loyal support base. We opened the pub on the 26th of July, 1985. Paddy had asked Charlie O'Hara to, to open it officially. The Dublin footballers came down, and politicians came, musicians came. The place was crazy that day. The helicopter arrived with Charlie, you know, and it, it, it's something out of a television series or something, you know. Over the next years, Paddy started a family and continued developing the local economy. Paddy wasn't shy in exploiting the fact that Dingle had been used for, for the great films that had been made there. You know, when Tom Cruise was filming there, Paddy made sure that somebody brought Tom Cruise to the pub and had Tom Cruise singing in the pub. These people who tend to be distant and diffident, uh, he made them feel relaxed. They, they felt, felt comfortable. I think most famously of all, Dolly Parton came. The last big, big night we had here was in 1985 when I captained the Kerry team. And we won the All-Ireland. And this is my jersey. And, and it hasn't been washed since, so... Dolly Parton, how she came into Ventry, I do not know. I'm sure that's one of life's great mysteries. It's a tribute to his force of personality. Today, Paddy's son, Padraig Oak, helps run the pub in Ventry. We've had a lot of famous visitors here through the years. Um, we've had our own Colomini here, a lot of political figures. Paddy was fascinated by politics. We've been a Gael and Fianna Fáil, Sinn Féin, so he, he covers covers them all. The American connection with the pub and with here would be, be very important because a lot of Americans would have relations who could be from Venture or from Kerry and when they come into the bar they'll tell you that such and such is their cousin and that they're they're very happy to be down here and the first thing they do I suppose when they when they come in here is they, they'll take a walk around the bar and look at all these pictures and they'll be very taken by them. <laughs> 
The gourmet stock safari. What I learned from Paddy about running a bar is to make sure you listen to the customer and make the customer feel very, very welcome. And we make sure that before they're leaving that the, they'll have something to remember the pub by and that certainly they come back again very soon. Paddy O'Shea's playing career reached dramatic heights in 1985, the year Kerry brought the Sam Maguire home to Ventry. Bringing the cup back to Ventry for Paddy was probably his ultimate achievement, as he would have seen it. It meant everything to him. Here he was, a Kerry captain, an elite, uh, following the footsteps of some legendary players. You know, having his nephews amongst the hordes who were, you know, greeting the team as, as they came in. There's a wonderful shot when he brought the Sam Maguire into the school where he was himself. This is what he should be thinking. And the strange thing, in the, very near the front of the class there, is Dar O'Shea, he might be 10 at the time, and as plain as could be, and he's looking up at that cup. Dara could be dreaming that hey, maybe someday I'll be coming in here with the cup. But in 1988, after huge success on the pitch and in business, Paddy O'Shea's world hit a seismic change. Paddy never saw the end coming. He should have seen it coming. It was quite clear he wasn't going as well as he thought he might be. And he was shocked when he heard that he hadn't, hadn't made the team. He couldn't believe it. He was missing a lot of training sessions. And he got a bad injury about two weeks before the Munster final that year. He had to get 14 stitches on his ear, actually. And I explained exactly why he was dropped to him. And we didn't accept it too well. You knew he'd have pussing him. That's how I describe it. But he wouldn't have uh, brought down the spirit of the camp in any way or on the day while the other young lads were preparing. He'd have been encouraging them. And there's Mick O'Dwyer. All of fumbling. In Cork, the day of the Munster final, then he would have been playing at right full back and Denny Allen was playing at left corner. Denny Allen scored four points that day for Cork. To Michael McCarthy here. Side towards Colin O'Neill, his first chance to impress. If he can lay it in for Dennis Allen. Oh, it's a great goal! Cork, one goal and 14 points. Kerry, 16 points. And straight away when the game was over, Paddy jumped out to the subs bench, ran over to me and said, if you put me on the team today, he said, Dini Allen wouldn't have scored four points and we'd have won the Munster Championship. So... <laughs> And he was, and he meant it. He wasn't, he wasn't kind of uh, having a bit of fun with him over. I think that if Paddy was playing that day, he wouldn't have stopped me getting that goal. <laughs> the recession in football had set in. Paddy was gone, and I think he found it hard to adjust to life without being really involved in football. And I would say, in a way, he was sort of a lost soul. He was giving out to Mikko and he was looking for reasons why he was dropped. You think you're wronged. You know, I knew it myself in the last year when I was, you know, I was taken off myself in the last couple of games that I played with Kerry. Stung. You don't like it. I mean, if you're doing something uh, from the moment you can walk and then suddenly you're gone and suddenly you have to kind of rearrange your priorities, rearrange everything in your life, really. For a couple of years after, we were on pretty bad terms. We didn't speak. But then he rang me one night and he said, Mick, I'm afraid I'll have to apologise to you. You were right to have dropped me because I wasn't fit to play. Paddy O'Shea had invested his life playing football, but at the age of 33, he was suddenly out in the wilderness.
little over a year and a half ago, the committee that had been formed came to me and asked me, would I mind it having it there? I discussed it with the family and they said, go ahead with it. It's almost three years since footballer Paddy O'Shea died unexpectedly in West Kerry. He was 57. A memorial is being prepared for unveiling across the road from the O'Shea home place. I have mixed feelings about it, obviously. I think it'll be uh, an extra attraction for tourists, but uh, every day we'll be looking out, you know, and just seeing it, you know. It'll be a constant, a constant reminder of, of the fact that he's gone, you know. And for Podrick as well, you know, seeing it this evening, it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's hard on him. It's hard on him. But Paddy O'Shea is remembered not just as a footballer, after being dropped by Mick O'Dwyer in 1988, he had some difficult decisions to make. He was heavy and he didn't really make much of an effort with his training, not the way he used to be. Then in, in 1989, he made a huge, huge effort again. He dropped weight and he got really fit again and he did all the old training that he used to do and he got injured. And uh, the injury, I think, probably scared him. And uh, after that, he just decided, I'm going to pack it in. And uh, that was it. Body struggled without football. He wanted to be Kerry manager in 89, 90, when he wasn't ready. Um, and he took it very personally when he was rejected. He felt that the authorities in the county didn't trust him, that he was this mad poor from West Kerry, uh, whereas in fact he thought about his football very seriously. By 1995, Kerry football was out in the cold. They hadn't won an All-Ireland in 10 years. Paddy O'Shea saw an opportunity. They were fitter, they were focused. Things had got bad. Uh, there was a toxic enough environment in the county because Kerry public certainly expect an awful lot of their county team. Kerry had gone nine, 10, and subsequently 11 years without winning an All-Ireland, which you know, to most counties wouldn't be that bad, but in Kerry it was viewed as, you know, it wasn't good enough. Within a year and after several applications for the job, Paddy O'Shea was finally named manager of the Kerry team. It didn't take him long to deliver. O'Shea has it again, nephew of Paddy, of course. Son of Mihal kicking and scoring. Dan O'Shea getting a second point for Kerry. So Morris Fitzgerald kicks this one. Deep, right in there, and it's all over. And Kerry have won back the all Ireland title. Winning 97 was critical to everything that Paddy O'Shea did because had he not won the All-Ireland that year, uh, there certainly the knives would have been out to get him. I think it gave him an awful lot of personal satisfaction, not just because it silenced the critics, but I think he, he, he proved to himself as well as to anybody else that, yes, I really can do this job. You know, a personality who can rise people is rare enough in a sports context. Paddy started an analysis, of the opposition, what they do, what they tend to do, what this guy does, you know, that, that was unheard of. It was very personal and there was letters written, there was contact made with your parents to make sure that you were playing as well as you could be for Kerry. This fella had actually delivered on his word and we would not have won that all Ireland round, no way. He was exactly what was needed right there, right then. Paddy was also helping build a footballing dynasty. The young nephews who'd learned from him began taking the field for Kerry. O'Shea coming to try and catch, he drops it down. And Paddy O'Shea won't be one bit happy. In Dara's case, he had been there before Paddy, but at the same time, he hadn't established himself as a leading inter-county midfielder. That happened during Paddy's regime. And there were doubts, of course there were. Kerry supporters, they wouldn't have spared Dara or Tomas or Mark. And Paddy as well would have got a few slings and arrows at the time because of that, accusations of nepotism and such. Paddy would have been harder on Dara and Thomas and Mark than he would have been on the, the other members of the team. He wouldn't have liked if they were a minute late for training or if they didn't put, give it all in their training. It's their 32nd time to win the All-Ireland. Paddy O'Shea brought Kerry to another great All-Ireland win in 2000. Back to the kingdom. However, within a couple of years, his story began to unravel. 
In 2002, Paddy's oldest brother Michael, father to three Kerry players, died suddenly of a heart attack. It was a tough year, 2002. Paddy was in charge. There was three of his nephews playing on the team. Dara was captain. We played uh, Cork on the Sunday in Killarney. My dad passed away two days later. Um, so we had to gear ourselves up again for the replay the following Saturday. There was a debate at the time, were Kerry going to play, were the lads going to show up? I don't think in their own heads there was ever a debate about it. They were always going to play for Kerry. It was the rest of us that didn't really show up on the day. And I think that generated a lot of hurt within the camp at the time. You know, we, we had realised that we had hit the wall and here you had three players after losing their dad that week. And, you know, there was a kind of realisation on Paddy's part as well that he, above anybody else, needed to pull things together. Could it be done? No, it's all over. We lost that game and it was a long year, but funnily enough, we actually played the best football. Any any Kerry team I was involved played that year. Darrow Kinage on the ball. A week or two after that game, we went in the qualifier route, playing teams like Wicklow and Fermanagh, and absolutely demolishing them. comes forward and drives the goal. I think it was pure anger been just vomited out onto the pitch, you know, from our point of view. Um, got to the final, um, playing absolutely brilliant football, led by Pawdy and top of his game as a manager at this stage, six or seven years in. Tomas O'Shea feeding it in, and good defensive play by Armagh. It's out to Kieran McGeady, the captain. It's all over. A fantastic day for Armagh. They have won the All Ireland. Armagh won 12, Kerry 14 points. In 2003, Kerry hadn't won an All-Ireland final for three years. With Paddy and the Kerry team in South Africa, a storm was brewing over remarks made in a newspaper article. But Paddy was everywhere. And it really became a major topic of conversation. He's a rough man, he speaks roughly, especially after a couple of points. He, uh, put a joke like this, it's not right for the trainer to represent the Kerry team to be saying those things, I think. When he made that comment, I thought he brought out in the open the unreasonableness of a lot of supporters. They expect miracles. When they don't get them, they can be very, very nasty. I understood what he meant when he said that. I, I still agree with what he said. I mean, Kerry supporters are brilliant, but Kerry supporters could cut the legs off you as quick as they'd pat you on the back. And that's just the nature of the game. That's the nature of every sport. What he meant was, very simply, was that the Kerry people demand success. That they're so used to winning all Ireland's that in that context, they're animals because they're, they're, they're so demanding. The controversy caught fire. Marty Morrissey was on holidays in South Africa at the time. I got to Cape Town and uh, went for a walk in the local shopping centre, only to find the Kerry footballers. Paddy would love to meet you. And I said, tell Paddy to ring me. So Paddy rang me the following morning. He said to me, I need to do an interview. He'll do the interview. He wanted to kill it as quickly as possible. The Kerry supporters have been very loyal to me over the last 30 years. And I say that basically if I've offended them, I'm sorry, I apologize. His effort was to try and kill it. I think it was breaking his heart because Kerry meant everything to him. But I think the sands of time were kind of going against him. The row continues. Apology not enough, says a headline in the Kerry Man today, quoting the supporters organisation. But the final whistle had blown. Ten months after the newspaper article, the Kerry County Board met to decide on Paddy's future. Long before there was Twitter or Facebook, you know, there was social media in the GA, and it would have gotten out, it would have gotten to Paddy that the gun was being put to his head. Somebody went along and, you know, told Paddy that the decision has been made before he had been officially informed. Well, I rang Paddy and I told him I wanted to meet him. And uh, he obviously had an inkling that there was something wrong from within the executive. And I said, I just want to discuss the, the managership. And he said, uh, am I being replaced? And I said, you are. And uh, that conversation ended fairly abruptly. A time to call a halt for Paddy O'Shea as he arrived at Killarney. This was a guy who had given everything to Kerry, both as a player and as a manager, and the way that he was treated. Mm, I'm, I'm, I, I don't think it was uh, the pe people that made that decision that it was their finest hour. In the circumstances which have arisen, and after careful consideration, 
I have decided not to seek the renewal of my appointment as manager of the Kerry team. For the way it ended, we weren't happy with that at all. It wasn't the way to end uh, for a guy who lived football, and there are plenty of guys who live for different sports and for different teams and all that, but he literally lived for Kerry football. Paul probably loaded the gun himself, but it still came as a shock, you know, when he was given Bottog's bore, as they called it at the time. O'Shea said he was still hurt by the manner in which his term as manager had been ended by phone. Of course, the, the, there would be huge regrets around everything of that time. People are saying that I handled it badly in relation to party uh, and replacing party. I, uh, obviously, I had a job to do as chairman of the county board. I was elected to do that job. The decision was taken that party would be replaced, party's tenure wouldn't be renewed. I suppose we saw parties being indestructible, you know, and no different to Mick O'Dwyer. Mick was in charge for years, and we just thought that that was going to be the case. Maybe we're living in our own world, I don't know, but. As with other setbacks, Paddy retreated to West Kerry to consider his next move. It would hurt him when he'd be sacked because he was a winner. He was competitive. So to suddenly be labelled, in his own mind, a loser, was hurtful. He would talk himself about those dark days, you know, middle of winter, nothing happening, nobody around. Um, he hated that. There's a sadness to everybody at different times. There was, you know, he, he, he thought a lot, you know. And I would say especially if he was alone, you know. Outside, you know, for the public, he was garrulous and talkative and, you know, but um, so very few outsiders would have seen that. People who knew him well would have known that, you know, that, you know, he, there was this streak in him. He'd be down for a couple of days, maybe a week, but suddenly the light would shine and Paddy would be back on full power again with another project. Then in 2004, Paddy answered a call that put him back in the spotlight. I remember Paddy saying, I'll never again manage anybody else, ever. Three or four days later, he was above in Westmeath. <laughs> he was a gas man like. Paddy O'Shea was appointed manager of County Westmeath in 2004. In over 100 years of GAA games, Westmeath had never won a senior championship title. When he wanted to get something, he, he did everything to make sure that he achieved that goal. Whatever way he was going to do it, but he did. He was able to cajole players. He was able to instill belief in them. But at the same time, he could give it to them straight between the two eyes. You were fucked over the line twice. Fucked you over the line like you'd catch a fucking loaf of bread and fucked you over the line with his shorts up. And what that does is, it lifts the opposition. We don't want to see no West Meat man fucked about. Is that clear now, Alan? No more. You will have to be closer. Closer to fuck. We'll have to fucking crash into these fellas and test out their fucking pulse. Because I'm telling you, lads, these fellas will play good football if they're allowed. Give me one fucking guarantee, each and every one of you, that you're going to be tighter that you're going to be more disciplined, that you're going to be more tigerish, and that you're going to take the fucking game to these fellas. That these fellas will get such a fucking shell shock next Saturday evening that we'll put them back in their fucking asses for fucking 10 years. All right, lads. Paddy and Westmead fought leash in that 2004 final. Ironically, a face from the past confronted Paddy from the opposing dugout. It was Mick out of wire, and he party was saying, Jesus, I can never get away from this fella. And so that was a big challenge for him now again. Could he get the better of out of wire? We were up, I think, three points, um, and Leash came back. In the dressing room afterwards, uh, the players were very disappointed. They had their head down. Paddy just came into the dressing room and he went, he went at them, gave out to them to lift their heads straight away that this was no way to act, okay? We were still in this game and that we were coming back here next week and we were going to perform 
better than what he did today and we were going to win it. He brought them back the following Saturday and the result went their way and Westmead won their first Leinster championship. It's over for the very first time. Westmead are Leinster senior football champions. They have made history. Tony O'Shea. I think that that was one of Paddy O'Shea's greatest, greatest achievements. And maybe if it was the, the two fingers to Sean Walsh and to the Kerry executive, so be it. Because I was absolutely thrilled that Paddy O'Shea had the resolve to go and do that. And listen, lads. <laughs> listen, lads. It takes a good man to take his beating, but it takes a better man who's the winner to keep it inside and to, to hold his head. I think it took him until he got back to Mullingar to really fully comprehend what, my, what this meant. And he saw an outpouring of emotion and an outpouring of love. And that's, that's what it was. Those people absolutely loved him on, for that couple of days because he had done something for them that they'd never believed in their lives would ever happen. Um, and he had delivered. When the Westmeath dream ended, Paddy spent a brief spell managing County Clare. But at the age of 52, Paddy had passed the summit of his career. It didn't click, you know? And I think Paddy knew it didn't. The, the magic dust that he sprinkled everywhere, like in Kerry and in Westmeath, just didn't sparkle. From 2007, and with time on his hands, Paddy took stock of his health and future. I suppose with the rest of the family having had heart trouble that he felt that he might be a likely candidate as well. So he had got it checked out and indeed there was problems there all right now. He never told us too very much about it, but I think that he opted to go down a, a, a medicine routine rather than have a stint or something like that. I suppose in hindsight, he should have taken much more care of himself, you know. He, he, he felt that he was invincible in a way. I was at Michal O'Shea, that great friend of parties. He was on the phone. And he said four words. Os gaelge, ta ri imeha uing. Our king has left us. There was no need for me to ask who has left us. There was only one king. We were ringing friends and, you know, was it true? How could it happen? How could he have left us so soon? The whole parish were, were, were mourning. I had sat down with him for dinner a few days before I went on my travels, and to hear the news when you were out of the country, miles and miles away, it was, it was a huge shock. Everybody in their life have memories of when they heard news, whether it be good or shocking news. For me, in the passing of Paddy O'Shea was a bit poignant. I was sitting in a central council meeting in Dublin of the GA, and on my phone started ringing in my pocket and kept ringing and ringing and ringing. I left the room and I rang back to be told that Paddy O'Shea had passed away. I got a phone call uh, from one of the other players and I, I was just, I had to sit down. I rang Dara and I said, is there something up in order to vote? And Dara said, yeah, Paddy's gone, you know, and, uh, um, it took us a while, you know. We knew him well. Anytime Paddy used to come in on a bus and he'd see Crow Park, he used to get excited. And he jumped up and he went down the bus and he sat in beside one of the lads anyway. He said to him, Jesus, he says, you have to be out in front of your man a bit quicker than you were the last day. You were hanging back. The ball was going in too fast. You weren't coming out. And uh, your man turns to Paddy and he says, Jeez, Paddy, I'm the physio. <laughs> I found it difficult to think of a story of Paddy simply because there were so many to tell. But for me, Paddy was a big family man while also being very good to the people around him. Oh yeah. Go and be there. Oh, fair to be there again, Mummy. Just clean the roots before. Before a game, so get fairly muddy. 
Some three years on, Moira O'Shea and the family are coping with Paddy's death. There's an old saying around here, if a door closes, a window opens. So little Fia came along and she has just made such a difference. She has revitalised the place again. It's, it's amazing what a little baby can do. It's, it's, it's been a huge, huge uh, uh, way to move on, I suppose. To us, he was just like any other dad. We were very proud of him and what he had achieved. And um, unfortunately, he never got to meet her, but um, hopefully she has some of his traits. He's left a massive legacy here and there's still lots of tourists coming in, th in through the doors and it's great. The foundations Paddy O'Shea laid are clear. While six times All-Ireland medal winner Dara watches from the sideline, Mark O'Shea is chasing his sixth All-Ireland medal on the Kerry senior team. And Padraig Og plays for Angueltacht. The next generation of O'Shea footballers is still very much in the making. Sons of all Ireland winners will empathise very much with Parlick's situation at the moment, and Parlick will take this the right way. You can be a son of an all Ireland winner, you can go out and play a match for your club, you can catch every ball, you can make every block, you can make every tackle, and come off the pitch feeling great about yourself. And somebody in the crowd will say, he'll never be as good as his old fella. Parlick is a very good footballer, he's a good young man, and whatever his success, he gets, he will, he will earn it. There is pressure on him, there's too much pressure on a young lad. He needs to go away and, you know, do what lads of his own age are doing, which is going to college and doing what they do in college, you know. So, um, I mean, I'd miss him and all that, but for his own sake, it's better that he goes, you know, for a couple of years and, you know, do, do a bit of growing up. Potty did an awful lot for, for me as a Kerry footballer. He taught us the, the, the things to do on a football field, the things not to do on a football field, how to carry yourself as a Kerry footballer. He was there, he did it. You know, he, he, he was a winner, he won with Kerry, he lost with Kerry. Um, he was true with all. He was our uncle, he was my godfather, and uh, we had great time for him. And he used to pass that kind of uh, love of the game on to us. We grew up through the golden years, you know, from, from 75 onwards. We got used to success and we got used to seeing that. Mark is the last of our family to be playing with Kerry at the moment and, you know, hopefully down the line someone belonged to us will play again, hopefully. That's what you'd hope. The unveiling of Paddy O'Shea's statue at the crossroads at Orde Woher is a well-attended event. Family and friends reflect on a life's contribution to football and West Kerry. It's a very proud day for the O'Shea's today. Uh, there's people coming from far and near and they're all coming to honour Paddy. Already there's a huge crowd here, so we're really excited and looking forward to the day now. We hope it's going to be a good representation of Paddy. It's, it's, it's so emotional that it's, it's hard to talk about it, really. A do, a hail, and now the right lad of At heart, he was a Nord of Ohirpers. That was his place, and he never forgot that. When he started Comortis, the football festival, there were four teams. He developed over the years. It became that there were thousands of people in the middle of February arriving down in West Kerry, giving the whole economy a boost at the most unlikely time of the year. I think it's probably fitting that he should have a memorial inventory because the place was so important to him that you couldn't really imagine that being anywhere else. He'll never be dead, like, he'll always be around the place and his memory will always live on. Um, and what he achieved will be remembered always, you know. He made such a noise and such, such clattering when he was around, it's, it's be hard to forget him, like, you know. He was a character, brilliant footballer. He was a rogue, he was passionate. It was great fun. He had his black moments. But he was, above all else, a, a true friend. A great friend to so many people. It's good. I'm happy with it. If I need to discuss something or if I need to chat, you know, 
can do it. If I feel something, I need something to get something off my chest, I can give out to him, you know? <laughs> Next Tuesday, colleagues, family and friends help to paint a picture of former businessman and rugby union player Antonio O'Reilly, the real deal at 25 to 10. Stay with us now for another chance to catch Saturday Night with Miriam. <laughs>